Welcome everybody, members of the public. Uh, we're gonna move over to housing, our ho omnibus housing bill. And this morning we're gonna be focused on land use, plannings, permitting, all those good things that uh, some, which we hope will identify some, sometimes unnecessarily increase the cost of housing, the length of permitting, and try and pick away at those pieces to promote uh, more housing through policy as opposed to just putting more money into the issue. So um, Regina, welcome. I don't think we've met, it's a pleasure. Um, if you want to start us off, uh, if I've given you enough to go on, uh, I think you'll give us plenty to go on. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Senators. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, I am Regina Mahoney. I work for the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission. I've uh, been there for about 10 years and prior to that was uh, planning director in the town of Milton. Um, and today I'm here talking with you folks uh, more on behalf of the Vermont Planners Association. So um, over the summer and the fall, uh, we put together a housing position paper and it's got sort of four main recommendations. So I'm going to be sort of walking through that and explaining how um, some of the provisions of H511 uh, uh, S226 and S101 kind of uh, fit in and are supported by that position paper. Um, just quickly for those that don't know, the Vermont Planners Association is a nonprofit advocacy and education organization. Uh, we've got about 200 planners um, from all levels of government and the private sector consulting firm firms, and we are uh, dedicated to the advancement of planning in the state. Um, so in putting, in VPA putting together our housing position uh, state, statement, we did uh, work quite a bit from the housing barriers report, which a number of planners put together over the last year and really focused on the neighborhood development uh, area designation improvements. And that document is really the grounding place for H511. So over this sort of same time period in the fall, um, myself on behalf of EPA, as well as uh, DHCD staff, uh, Chris and Jacob, uh, as well as VNRC, uh, worked with um, Representative Bongartz on that bill. Um, so uh, there was a good, really good amount of working. We had a number of meetings and really worked through the starting place of that housing barriers report um, and really uh, got to a very workable place that uh, we felt in H511. Um, so uh, if, it, if it helps, I can sort of walk through um, VPAs for overall recommendations for housing and then really sort of pinpoint where H511 and also it looks like your draft 2.1 of S226 really has incorporated a lot of that uh, great, great work in there. Um, so if that sounds like a good approach. Sounds fine. Okay, excellent. Um, so I, I just sent this over to Scott this morning, um, but I'm also happy to share my screen as I walk through this. Do you, do you have a preference? Uh, I have a preference of sharing the screen because I can't print anything. Okay. All right, excellent. Let me just. So if people so, have questions as we go, you're gonna have to shout out because I will <laughs> not see your pictures anymore. Okay, uh, is that zoomed in enough for you to see? Uh, probably bigger. Uh, a little bigger. bigger would be great. Excellent. So we're looking at draft 2.1. Uh, 
Oh, this is so, their report, I think. Oh, this is their report, right, sorry. Yes. Um, so uh, our overall housing recommendations, uh, again, there's four main rec recommendations. Uh, the first one really is a uh, recommendation to fund and implement water and sewer infrastructure in our uh, existing settlements. Uh, really from a, a big picture perspective, there's only uh, so much we're going to be able to do without uh, without working on that. And certainly ARPA, big help. <laughs> uh, the infrastructure bill will be a big help. Um, but just uh, wanting to sort of point that out and not not lose sight of that. Could you give so, us, could you give us an idea of what big help means? I mean, what is the uh, I, it's probably an unfair question, but very broadly, what is the dollar need out there and how much was mm -hmm. in ARPA for this? How much is in infrastructure for this? When will we know that? Um, and we're also have, as you probably have are aware of followed S33, which is our mini TIF bill. And one of the mm -hmm. questions we've been asking doesn't, this number one, like totally subsume the need for mini TIFs? Um, great question. And I don't have a great answer for you. Um, I do know in our region, Westford is a, is a great example of trying to put some uh, uh, municipal wastewater system in place to help support their uh, village and neighborhood de designation. Uh, area designation. Um, and they are big proponents of that mini TIF bill. Um, and they, they can speak to it much better than I can. But um, even with ARPA funds on the table, uh, the help of that mini TIF would be, uh, is still a, a quite a huge need. Um, uh, couldn't give you specific dollar amounts um, off the top of my head, but um, these projects, unfortunately, are very complicated and definitely very costly. So um, I think both ARPA and the infrastructure bill is helpful, um, but I don't believe that it's solving the need in full. So let me, let me play devil's advocate and maybe I'm just missing something. The numbers that I remember from Westford is they wanted to get essentially a million dollar loan through the TIF program that they would pay off through increased property tax payments in the future. Instead of that, couldn't ARPA or infrastructure just write them a check for a million dollars? Um, I think it depends on how it's going to, how the program is going to work from this date. Um, I could, uh, look up how much Westford is actually getting from their ARPA funds directly. Um, I don't know that off of the top of my head. Um, and, and we don't know, we don't know on infrastructure, we don't have all the details yet about how, right. that, how much money is going to go out. Yeah. And, and yeah. that's a bit of a challenge, quite frankly, here, just in terms of the money flow and what's duplicative and what isn't. I mean, it's just, we uh, need yeah. to... it's no secret that I, I've been a big fan of many TIFs. I went to the governor's press conference, stood beside Senator Brock on, on this, uh, and it's pretty easy for us to just throw it in the bill because we've worked it over. But right. I really would like to have this question answered. Is it, and I, I guess it's certainly necessary maybe for 10 years out when all this largesse goes away, but is it really necessary now, I guess? I'm sure we're going to be asked that the House is going to be asking that question. So if somebody could get an answer to us, it would be great. Mr. Yeah. Chair, I would recommend talking with Neil Kamen from the Agency of Natural Resources. I know he's worked closely with this, this town of Westford and you know he's the point person at ANR leading all the infrastructure investments in water and wastewater. And us is also familiar with the mini TIF proposal. And I'm yeah. happy to reach out yep. to him. Kamen, K-A-Y. Um, 
K A M E N, I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, Chris. Neil, okay, Scott's got it, I'm sure. Okay. Okay, I rudely interrupted. <laughs> no worries. Okay. Uh, so, uh, second big recommendation from the Vermont Planners Association is to uh, make some improvements to the neighborhood uh, development area designation um, and the other state programs. Um, so, first kind of sub part of that is really um, making the neighborhood designation more accessible for the rural communities. Um, so, right now we have seven neighborhood development area designations in the state. Five of those are in Chittenden County. Um, and I can just say from, from our perspective in Chittenden County, this designation is a really great, valuable, helpful designation uh, in really making housing happen. Uh, so the more that we can really support uh, um, some, removing some barriers to that designation program for more communities, I think all the better we're gonna be. Um, so one concept there um, that was described in the housing barriers report was talked about in H511 and looks like it's been added to your uh, draft 2.1 of 226 is the concept of not requiring a municipality to have water and wastewater already in place as a prerequisite to getting the neighborhood development area designation. Um, I think the getting the designation first on the table can help invite the housing developers to the table. And then water and wastewater is uh, something that uh, needs to be permitted and it will be properly permitted uh, with um, housing developments that come forward. Um, and there's also just some great uh, improvements to decentralized systems and the lots more things that can sort of happen from that front. So at least by a project by project basis, just allowing a little bit more flexibility in that program, I think is gonna be pretty helpful. Does it, does it potentially open up a loophole that will result in sprawl or non-smart growth? I don't think so because um, the neighborhood development area designation still has so many other parameters in place, largely the uh, minimum density requirement. And so we're already looking at relatively uh, tight locations. It also uh, really needs to, um, it only buffers and goes on top of um, the other designations that are already in place. And those parameters are pretty tight. Um, and as is, the state designations are um, really, you can see in uh, 2B there, 0.3% of the state's land area. These are little, little places <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. Um, and so I, I don't think we need to be concerned about these, these areas just becoming huge and, and overwhelming and sprawled out. Um, we're still talking about a relatively small area, even with this initial provision off the table. Uh, Mr. Chair, may I just add, I think we think of our designated downtowns as actually being bigger areas than they actually are. They're quite very Surprised, I think people are always surprised at how actually contained they are. And my sense of the NDAs is that they're just sort of like the next ring around what we all consider our downtowns. Is that a fair way of describing that, Regina? I mean, yes. it's contiguous. They have to be contiguous to our downtown and village centers. And they, they're kind of what, I mean, so in Woodstock, where I live now, I would hope would be an, an an NDA, but it's not part of the designated downtown, even though I am a block and a half from Route 4. So you'd think that I was right in the center of Woodstock, but I'm actually not part of the designated downtown because that is a tiny little area. So I guess, yeah. uh, I, th I think I need to understand this one a little bit more. Um, so they get the designated down, the, the designation, prior to them having 
sewer or water or or both? You're yes. taking away water. Okay, is it both? They can they they can have one. They don't have to have either at the time of getting the designation, right? Correct. They but don't have to have either. But you're saying the smart growth housing development that ensues from the designation couldn't go forward until they had the water and sewer in place. Right. And I, I think the concept is that um, it's possible for a housing development to come forward and work out a system for themselves that doesn't necessarily require a much larger complex municipal level system put in place. Um, and, you know, I think the, the other way to kind of think about this too is um, there, there are not gonna be that many areas that are coming forward through this program without, uh, without water um, in place or without the potential for municipal wastewater in place. It's just sort of a matter of timing and lining things up um, that this will provide a little bit more flexibility um, so that a municipality can really start to do their planning and get their zoning right, get into the NDA program. And if the wastewater water is coming either at a project specific um, level that can work great, or the municipality may be working more towards water, wastewater. It just is, takes a long time. And so at least everything, all the processes can sort of be working collectively together as opposed to having to have water and wastewater in place first and then get the NDA. I, I, I think I understand what you're saying, but in response to the question, you weren't saying that there at some point before the, the actual housing is built, the water and sewer on a municipal level or a, a system as opposed to individual wells and septic systems would have to be built. You're saying, no, they can get their designation and maybe they don't need that. Unit. So in essence, you're not just delaying for timing's sake, you're actually eliminating a requirement. Am I being clear? Um, a, a housing development is not going to be constructed without a water and wastewater permit. So they will have a water and wastewater system in place to manage that housing development. But it could be individual systems for each house, right? And it most likely wouldn't be individual necessarily because of the scale of developments that we're talking about here. It could be, uh, but it may be more of a community system. And so not necessarily publicly owned but a community system. Um, uh, and, and I think the idea, the point being, all of these options um, are possible from a water wastewater perspective. Um, and so really it can be more based on the housing need as the projects come forward, um, rather, than a, rather than getting a municipal system in place if, it's not, if that's not necessary. Okay. If that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I think it makes sense. I just, uh, I think I need to feel a little bit more comfortable that um, the existing law sort of was, uh, the timing might not have been right, but the, it, it sounded like it was designed to be, have denser housing on a congregate water, wastewater system uh, where everybody uh, would be hooked up to that. But um, let's move on. We'll, we'll get, we'll figure that out. Um, okay. Um, okay, uh, then 
uh, second point under that is uh, we've talked about this for uh, a few years now, and it was in S101 and now looks like, again, in 2.1 of 226, is the concept of if you do have a municipal water or wastewater system in place and the municipality is issuing their own water or wastewater permits, um, that there is a redundancy with also having to get a state water and wastewater permit as well. Uh, so uh, VPA supports this uh, provision that would um, remove the state water and wastewater permit in a, in a situation where the municipality is already permitting those. Okay. We're very familiar with that one. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, moving on here. So again, this is under the same recommendation in terms of improving the uh, state designation programs um, and eliminating redundant uh, development review and the associated fees that, that come along with that. Um, so uh, B1 here, we really, really support the concept of taking a look at the de state designation programs as a whole. Um, there are a number of them. They were created for different reasons. And uh, we always are finding ourselves in, a, in the place of trying to use these programs to define where we want growth to happen. And that seems like the most logical <laughs> reason to have these state designation programs. Um, but it would be great to just be able to take a look at them collectively and uh, um, with that intent yeah. in mind. Thanks. Yeah, we've talked about this for a couple of years. Yeah. So that's great. Um, uh, VPA is also in support of extending the downtown and village center um, tax credit programs to the NBAs. Um, that was in SO 101 as originally uh, introduced, and it looks like it's in your new S226 as well. Um, also, uh, the concept of applying for a neighborhood designation, development area designation um, by a joint application of two municipalities seems like uh, uh, in support of that great idea. Um, also in support of the concept of including flood hazard and fluvial erosion areas in the NDA uh, where pre-existing development already exists in those areas. And if the municipality itself has adopted the rules for appropriately regulating growth in these areas. So if the municipality has their flood hazard and river corridor protection bylaws in line with ANR's rules at the local level. So in support of that, um, there's also a minor tweak in terms of how uh, the four dwelling units per acre is, I, is um, established and defined for the neighbor, neighborhood designation areas and VPA is in support of that. And then uh, last bullet here, uh, BPA is in support of removal of the priority housing project caps altogether. Um, and so I think that's where um, your original S226 landed and it uh, looks like your new S226 um, has a modification to that. And it, it probably acts, I'm not sure if it follows what was in H511, um, but uh, just broadly speaking from BPA's perspective, uh, the priority housing projects are excellent. It's what we need, it's what we want um, to not only help address the overall housing supply challenge, but also the affordable and moderate um, supply challenge. and. Uh, just not sure that there's a lot of reason why those should be capped in any way in order to access the Act 250 exemption in these areas. Um, so, well, uh, I, mean, I guess, I mean, I, I guess my res 
response would be if the city of Burlington wanted to build a housing project with 2,000 units, there may be some reason to have Act 250 review in something that big. And just because there's a designated downtown, I mean, I just, I, I don't know. That's why I, I think a total elimination of the cap may be a little bold at this point. Uh, Chris, you have a comment? Yeah, Mr. Chair, um, currently for larger municipalities, there is no cap. Um, so what this is intended to do. So if Burlington wanted to permit 2000 units. So um, Cambrian Rise, you know, has is a priority housing project, um, you know, permitted units. Um, it was not required to get an Act 250 permit, nor was, um, was it, is it City Place, you know, the one in downtown. Um, and I think it's just a point of equity, you know, it's like, we want to see more development happen in some of our smaller towns. The changes to the NDA program are aimed at giving them the same opportunities that our larger municipalities have. What the right number is, um, um, you know, BNRC feels like it should be more modest in a change, but they're open to making a change. Um, obviously the planners have a different opinion and want it completely eliminated. So I hope that helps. Uh, okay. Chris, yeah, so, so I apologize. I thought that there was caps, varying degrees of caps on every size community, but yeah, uh, I did too. The, the theory yeah remains the same in terms of the suggestions for the smaller ones. If you're, if you're eliminating a cap for a real small town and all of a sudden a giant housing project comes in, uh, should there be Act 250 review in, in that case? But we'll, we'll look at it. Uh, and I apologize for the diversion. I did have a- uh, wait, Mr. Chair- I, Go wait, ahead, 10 o'clock. I know we're gonna look at this more fully. But I, I would just like to ask at this moment, um, the at what point does local planning and a uh, town plan and local zoning uh, tr trump no caps? I mean, I mean because our smaller communities need some protection from exactly that kind of a situation. So. I guess there, without Act 250 to fall back on, would we be allowing our, our town plans and our local planners to be able to make decisions about that? Yeah, uh, I, uh, go, go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, part of the designation, you know, we do look at the community's bylaws, you know, so they have to do a lot of work to make sure that that housing is located in a right in the right locations and minimize impacts to important natural resources. Um, so it's not just like any town can get this. They have to meet minimum standards to achieve the designation to right. create a larger area to allow a priority housing project to occur. But you know, to your question, you know, at what point does a large development have a regional impact? And you know, that is kind of the intent of Act 250 to to look at that. Um, I guess the other pressure too is, you know. The, the suggestion of the removing the cap in H511 also is based in some facts, you know, um, VHFA and, you know, invite, please invite them to speak, you know, did an analysis of kind of the economy of scales for an affordable house. <coughs> and they found over 40 was kind of the sweet spot. So when we're trying to, you know, get the most out of our resources, you know, a 40 unit development or more is, is more affordable to build and right now, those can't go into a smaller community unless and qualify for PHPs unless these caps are changed. Okay, Thanks, Chris. I remember that. Yeah. Thanks. Um, can I go back to um, flood hazard and then also minimum residential densities? Uh, mm -hmm. So that is saying that um, flood hazards and erosion areas with pre-existing development presently can't be part of um, the designated area? Yes. So currently the way that the neighborhood designation mm -hmm. area works is you first uh, define a geographic area right. um, and then collectively 
you know, look at it with the downtown board to see what, what's the right place. So you have to remove uh, flood hazard and uh, river corridors from that geographic area, even if there's already pre-existing development there. Um, and as we know, there's a, a good amount of our um, historic villages and downtowns are right up against these areas. And so this is not suggesting in any way that we um, get any closer to <laughs> any river, uh, river corridors or, or floodplains that we have, have now. It's just a way to try to um, acknowledge some infill in an appropriate way of doing it uh, within these areas so that we're not completely removing, removing them from the potential of additional housing if they've already got housing there already, if that makes sense. Uh, I think we need to phone a friend. <laughs> Mr. Chair, if I could add. No, no offense. I mean, it, it, it's confusing and it's new to me. And uh, I'm just, it sounds like it's an equitable thing where you're getting penalized for having pre existing housing that already works in a floodplain. Uh, that's the sense I'm getting, but I don't fully have so it. Mr. Chair, if I could add, you know, the, the neighborhood designation was updated, NDA does right after Irene. And we were being very conservative about excluding any buildings in, in river corridor areas. However, this is inconsistent with ANR's policy that allows infill um, to happen in, within these areas. And what we're proposing to change is, is basically bringing them, bringing the neighborhood designation in the line with existing ANR procedures and policies that allows safe infill within these areas. And you know, I would add that VNRC does support this. And it's an option, you know, if a community wants to add, you know, or do infill in these areas, they have to adopt, you know, town-wide floodplain protections. And so that supports our larger goal of protecting floodplains upstream and downstream to allow infill in these denser areas. Um, so this is something we've talked about at length before, and I think we it's passed out of this committee. It just never made it through the house. And the last one here, or minimum resident, what are, what are we trying to do on this one? So um, the, the base concept doesn't, doesn't change here. In order to have a neighborhood designation area, you have to allow for four, a minimum four dwelling units per acre um, as residential density in these areas. Um, the, the way that it was worded before was just uh, a, a little bit tricky um, in some places. And I see Jake has turned his video on and I'm going <laughs> to ask, phone a friend again, because he's, he's got more familiarity with how this actually works in the room. I, I think I remember this one, but go ahead, Jake. <laughs> yeah, it's the, the way it's uh, framed right now, it, it's, it's linking the four units an acre to a particular residential use, a single family detached dwelling. And this change would say that it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a single family detached dwelling unit so long as the local bylaws are allowing residential uses of four dwelling units an acre. Okay. Yeah. We, did we pass that at some point ever? I know we discussed it in the last bill. El, Ellen, do you remember where the, we can't, if we didn't pass it, we came close to passing it. Yeah, we certainly have discussed it. Okay. Is Ellen? Yeah, she should. Do you remember um, the Senate? So, hi. So the language, and I probably should double check before I say this, the language that's in, that's being referenced um, is different than what has been considered before, but it isn't. I, I, it's, so no, I don't think so. It's, it's less about the, in the past, you have considered different numbers um, for the density. And what's happening here is actually striking the reference to the single family aspect 
and allowing for the calculation to include multi units. So um, it isn't in the so in the past you have talked about the number of units per acre. Um, that is not really what this is doing. This is talking about what units count in that density calculation. So does this does that make the proposed future housing in these designated areas more dense or less dense? I don't, I don't think it changes the density necessarily. Uh, that's That still remains. It just allows, um, uh, it allows it to be in a variety of housing types and structures. So it could be, for single family houses on quarter acre lots, or it could be a quadplex yes. on an acre lot. And before, yes. and before it, had, it, it couldn't be a quadplex on an acre lot. Is that I, right? I, think. I almost need a picture graph, like a car. <laughs> well, I, I kind of want to go back to Jacob on this because this is the, we're talking about the calculation, not necessarily like, and how the area is zoned, not necessarily the exact housing in each neighborhood. So it's. Jacob was nodding his head. It, okay. Maybe it would be earlier anyway, when you were saying about the one house in a quarter acre. So he was nodding his head there and then we sort of lost his enthusiasm. Support. <laughs> let me see, see if I can think of a scenario. Um, so let's say you have a zoning district and there are uh, three uses allowed. And one is a single family residential use. There's one is a single family detached dwelling unit. Uh, one is a quadplex. And the third is a multifamily. And um, the way the bylaws, the way the municipal bylaws calculate density for the multifamily and the quadplex is uh, units per uh, land area. And, um, and let's say they, they require 10,000 square feet per, or per unit. That would meet the quarter acre requirement. Um, if that same zoning district though established a minimum lot size of a third acre, which is larger than a quarter acre, uh, for single family detached dwelling units. That and under the current statute, um, that would not be allowing a detached single family dwelling unit at four units an acre. So this would make it clear uh, for all residential uses that, um, that four units is what we're looking for. If you allow a residential use, the, the, there should be at least four units an acre. Does that help? It, it does to the extent I'm starting to feel that this is an attempt to assure greater density under the existing law. There could be less density, uh, but here with this tightening, and I'm not sure exactly how you're gonna get four units on every acre. Uh, for sure, or you're, you're, you're not gonna be barred from putting up four acres, four, four units on an acre, whether it be in a single family or four one quarter acre lots. Is that more or less what the intent is? Okay, beat that one pretty well. Uh, let's go on to three. Uh, so three is looking more at uh, local zoning. Um, so not talking about the state designation programs necessarily anymore. Um, and really uh, what the planners are, are coming forward and saying is we'd really love to have a, 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 a real comprehensive broad look at chapter 117 in full um, and really think through what uh, what improvements we, we could make to it um, as, a port, as opposed to some sort of little tweaks that we've, we've done along the way. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure that we've got anything like that in a bill so far, really sort of looking at a study committee for chapter 117 for the local zoning, but um, just letting you know we, we would be in favor of that kind of conversation. 
So planning for the planners. Planning for the planners. <laughs> um, you know, and, and partially, I think this is, we've seen a lot of really interesting uh, zoning reform done in other states. Um, and, and part of that is, is based on some real uh, data and work, and it's sort of done in different ways in, in different places. Um, like Massachusetts, as an example, has a, a um, minimum uh, affordable housing requirement for municipality. Um, and there are other states that are certainly looking at uh, eliminating single family zoning um, as, a, as, an, as the only permitted use in a, in a residential zoning district. Um, so lots out there, and I think lots that we should give consideration and thought to, um, but I'm not sure that we necessarily have the data or the understanding of really what's um, what's going on in Vermont. For example, I couldn't even tell you in Chittenden County right now uh, how much of our land area is only zoned for single family residential. Um, so I think there's, uh, the, the thought process here is there needs to be just some more collective effort on, uh, on looking at this more broadly. Um, so just uh, subparts under this is just really appreciation for the bylaw modernization grant program that's going to be hugely helpful. Uh, the municipalities that have this now are really looking forward to digging in and, and making some real improvements. Um, and just wanted to point out that the, uh, the program parameters around that grant program that didn't pass in S101 um, are supported by uh, by the planners, um, particularly in, in tied with a, a funding program that can help them make those changes. Um, part B here is um, the concept that when you get a local site plan or conditional use approval from the development review board, um, it should not expire any faster than two years. Um, so this is just acknowledging that some of these housing projects really take a lot of effort to put together. And if you get through your local approval process and you're working on all the other pieces and your local approval expires, and that makes you have to kick back into the program, um, that's, that's not very helpful. Um, so we, the, the planners support this provision of just making sure that those those approvals don't expire any any sooner than two years. Do you think um, there need, do you think there needs to be any qualifiers on this? I know if you get into the judicial system, there's all kinds of equitable qualifiers for change circumstances, et cetera. You know, the longer we we play this out, the world could change and what might have made sense two years ago doesn't make sense anymore. Um, I mean, and we generally do it in form of good cause exceptions or something. That has its own issues. Um, but uh, have you looked, at, uh, has there been any discussion in coming to this conclusion on things like that? No, and I think from the planning perspective, the two-year time frame doesn't feel uh, too long. Um, you know, we uh, zoning doesn't change rapidly. It's quite, it's quite the process to actually get it changed. So uh, certainly there could be some circumstances where something in the underlying zoning um, uh, changes, but... Uh, not really too worried about it with the two year time frame. Is the process so onerous? I'm trying to remember my years on DRBs. Uh, it seemed like there were plenty of permits that were expiring and it seemed like a simple process to get them extended. You may have to pay a more, you may have to pay a small fee and go in there and say nothing's really changed. But I'm just thinking like, you know, you have something that makes sense to and certain conditions are put on the permit. And then, you know, within the next six months or a year, a big building comes in and they get approved. And then all of a sudden, uh, the one you approved before doesn't make as much sense or you want another condition on it. Um, those are the kinds of 
individual circumstances where I don't know if two years is the right time. What is it now, six months generally? So right now, that's an excellent question. Right now, there is no uh, requirement uh, for putting an expiration date on these permits. So some municipalities don't include an expiration. Um, they, they may, they can write it into their bylaws and they can put an expiration in. Um, and some municipalities have a year uh, as an expiration date. Um, and that uh, can just be really pretty problematic in pulling together the rest of, uh, the rest of your permits. Um, and, you know, I think the challenge is, uh, which what we've been talking about today can help solve this for some, some housing developments in the, in the state designations because they're not having to get an Act 250 permit as well as a local permit. But um, outside of that, uh, in most places, uh, we are gonna be still in a situation where housing developments need to go and get both. Um, and if it takes a while to get the, all those other permits lined up within a year, that can be a tight time frame if you're having to get kicked back to the to the local level. Um, okay. Yeah, I guess this is probably some sort of sweet point there. Uh, yeah. Just going back to bylaw modernization, this is probably a question for Chris. Um, is there money in the budget anywhere? for more grants for bylaw modernization? Um, Mr. Chair, Chris Cochran, um, the, the governor did budget $600,000 in general fund for municipal planning grants. Um, but as we, we talked about this before, they are broadly cast and not as constrained um, or targeted as the bylaw modernization grants. Well, obviously we're big fans of that. Um, and we, we appreciate you getting that money out the door, but if there's not more money coming, why do we need a statute? Right. And, and is that enough? 600,000 doesn't strike me as maybe enough. Well, you're, you're talking to the wrong person. Of course it's not enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, no, I, I, I know, but this bill has, you know, we have opportunities here. Yeah, I mean, we could dedicate some of that money to a second round of bylaw modernization grants, or we could up it, or we could cut it. But before we decide on leaving that language in, it's kind of it'd be kind of weird if none of that money got used for additional bylaw modernization grants, unless the language that we had in 101 and the House tweaked. Um, sort of somehow applies to municipal planning grants as well. So I teed that up for you, Chris, where do we go with this? Um, I think you have lots of options on the table for how you'd like to, you know, I, I do think the governor um, recognizes that local zoning can be a barrier to housing production. Um, I think you could carve out a portion of it um, and dedicate it to the bylaw modernization grants. I do think, you know, we've talked before, the, the language that the House passed, um, you know, remember it got separated from the budget, it never ultimately did pass. So we ran a program that was slightly different um, than what was in S101. Um, I think you've got some flexibility to do any number of things. Um, um, you know, the MPG program by itself, you know, we could make it a priority for bylaw modernization grants. Um, so, um, I'm not really giving you an answer, but I'm just, um, I think there's, there's opportunity within the existing program to so continue to support it without creating a, a standalone program. Okay. Do you think we can enhance the effectiveness of the first round of grants with some money, like provide more support to those towns that got the grants in terms of technical assistance or, yeah. or, or, or working side by side or, you know, having a resource. Of yeah, that. I mean, 
Yeah, I think the next step to me is, you know, obviously the communities have to update their bylaws to qualify for the neighborhood development area designation. Um, so if you wanted to target a portion of it or make it a priority for us to say, you know, this amount of money shall be you know, allocated to help municipalities achieve neighborhood designation, I think that, that would be a smart, good strategic use of that funding. Okay, I think the uh, last, let's do C and then we'll take a break. Uh, All right. Yeah, so uh, accessory dwelling units. Um, so there were uh, changes made to accessory dwelling unit statute last year, and that uh, seems like it's been really great and helpful. There was some flexibility in terms of the uh, minimum size of the ADUs and some flexibility in terms of um, if you are going to require the owner occupancy that the owner could either live in the ADU or the primary structure. Um, and it sounds like from the planning community, they are seeing some more interest and in folks coming in for um, trying to get some ADUs. So that's all great news. Um, one thing that uh, does appear to be a, um, a little bit of a hurdle is um, a home that is currently permitted from a water and wastewater perspective for more than the number of bedrooms that they already have in the structure. So uh, a pretty typical example is gonna be that a home is uh, permitted from a wastewater perspective at four bedrooms, but only three bedrooms are actually uh, uh, built and in the home. So in theory, there's an additional bedroom that can be added. And if that were added just to the structure itself, there would not need to be any change in wastewater permit because it's just still same use, additional bedroom meets the allocation as originally granted. But if that additional bedroom is added as an accessory dwelling unit, then it kicks in the, uh, the wastewater permit, um, which is again, just sort of another hurdle and very seemingly an unnecessary hurdle when at the end of the day, the structure itself is still only gonna have the four bedrooms that already was permitted in, that, um, in the wastewater permit. So partially, I think the change that we've talked about already, which would at least remove the state wastewater permit from the situation in areas where you've got municipal water in place will be helpful for this, um, but there uh why men... why, is, why is it that what's the operative law that requires in the example you gave that you have to get another permit so yep, chris is raising his hand. um uh, chris cochran again um we did check in with um, ANR before this because I we have heard increasingly that it is the septic laws are a barrier um, to ADU production, um, and I don't from what my understanding and, and you should get I have got contacts that if you want to learn more about this from ANR who should speak to this but the concern is is less about the 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 septic capacity and more about peak flows of you know water capacity for both those units. Um, not my area of expertise, but, um, um, you know, these are systems that are in the ground for, you know, 50, 100 years, and they just want to make sure it's done right. Um, but I can get you contacts to, to get additional information about this issue. And, and I think there are some opportunities for them to make this easier within their existing rules. So, so this, basically, this basically what you're saying is that ANR presently says that the demand on wastewater is greater if, if, if there's two units that total four bedrooms, the demand on wastewater is great, greater than four, four bedrooms in one unit. It was a number, the, same number of bedrooms, but, but uh, broken up between a duplex or an ADU, they're requiring more 
capacity. More capacity. And the concern also was about water supply. Was there adequate water supply? If, you know, you had two kitchens and everybody's making dinner at the same time. Is there, you know, so right. again, not my area, but um, um, I do think it's worth a conversation with A&R to, to have a, get a good understanding of their rules and the intent behind them. And again, they do have opportunities to make it easier within their existing framework. And I don't think they're widely used or recognized. So this is for septic. This is not for people who are on sewer systems, right? I mean, this is slightly exactly. different. Exactly, yes. Yeah. And so septic systems already, one assumes there's less density. I mean, you're in a downtown that isn't very, I mean, right. yeah, well, you could be in Norwich. <laughs> this is not an issue for municipalities with sewer and water and capacity. Right. This is an issue in rural areas where somebody wants to build an ADU. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, you wanna mention four, it's pretty self-explanatory. Yes, so four is pretty, pretty self-explanatory, uh, nothing specific there, but uh, definitely just recognizing and appreciating what the state has been able to do in terms of uh, funding for, uh, uh, the, for those experiencing homelessness and just putting out some support to, to keep that going. Okay. Um, so I guess I have a question. Uh, I don't know if you can answer this, Chris. You know, there's been some talk about uh, a homelessness bill of rights. My understanding is that the House is working on that and that's a, a, a fairly, I think, a big lift in terms of time. Uh, and if they're working on it, I'd rather not have this committee, I'd rather have this committee deal with it when it comes over from crossover. Do you have any, or maybe Ellen, uh, it's probably David Hall who would know more about it, but does anybody know what the status of uh, issues addressing homelessness, or we haven't really talked about it much this year in this committee. And I assume that the House is working and will be sending us something. I, I do not know, but I'm happy to reach out to Chair Stevens and um, inquire. Okay, that'd be great. So thank you, committee. I'm going to suggest that we just continue on for a few minutes and not take a break, and then we'll finish up 15 minutes earlier. I assume everybody is okay with that unless you have a pressing need. Um, so Ellen, um, we're gonna I sort of set up meetings with um, uh, Damien and David. I'd like to see if I can set up a meeting with you as well for Monday where we can send some quality time seeing where languages and bills are and what you've heard and what I've heard and start getting into next iterations. We're starting to run into time pressures. Um, we have two more weeks. Uh, we actually have three more weeks, but I'd like to get at least the housing bill out uh, before we break for town meeting. Uh, I think this bill well, it, obviously today's discussion shows it very well that it's gonna have to do a drive-by and natural resources um, and probably have to go to finance and appropriations. So it needs uh, a fair amount of lead time. The economic development bill also will have to go to finance and appropriations, but not natural resources, I don't think so. Um, and I don't think it has, the, the choice of whether it goes to natural resources or not is one of the full Senate. Um, it doesn't go by rule. So there would have to be a decision of whether they take jurisdiction over it or not. But I wanna to continue to work with Chris and make sure, I mean, I, I, I see a lot of these ideas being directly on point of housing. And uh, I hope that all of these ideas can be preserved, but I think clearly they may need some tweaking in terms of getting to those points and that they may, may have more expertise than we do. So um, that's about all I have, unless you have some, anybody else has some 
observations I'd like to yeah. share this morning. Uh, Senator Brock, were you about to raise your hand before I, okay. Uh, Chris. Yeah, I mean, I, I, Senator Bray did take a look at H511 and has pulled many provisions in it into his Act 250 reform bill. Um, so I think they were very comfortable with them. I know VNRC testified largely in support to a lot of the provisions you heard um, about this morning. So, um, you know, I think they do need to do a drive-by, but I think they're fairly familiar with the bill. And, and, and my sense was there was a good amount of comfort. That's good to know. Good. Well, there's a lot of good stuff, I think, that, you know, it may not be the... Uh, silver bullets, but I think we're staying true to trying to find some policies that can help housing development um, and uh, without necessarily hurting the environment and, and on top of it actually helping principles of smart growth and better communities. So uh, music to planners ears, right? <laughs> And, and Definitely. Regina, I don't think there's time, but you know, I'd love to see the data that you did from your eco study that showed how your smart growth strategies in Chittenden County um, reduced natural resource impacts by channeling growth to areas where we'd like to see it happen. Yeah. Regina, I would like to, I've been working with Chris as a result of the significant amount of time we spent in this committee on accessory dwelling units. And we've come up with a series of brainstorming ideas. I'd appreciate him running those by the planners and see what they think of those because you're, I mean, you have some in there, but they're less uh, extensive than some of the ideas that we have put on the table. Many of our ideas are sort of directing resources towards incentivizing um, and also technical assistance for mm -hmm. use to, to make it very easy for somebody who has the space and wants to develop their house that they don't run into practical hurdles as well as legal hurdles. So, uh, so if you guys could work together, that would be great. Absolutely, yes. Definitely. Okay. Great. Thank you, everybody. Uh, 15 minutes early. <laughs> <laughs>